Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the first portion of the 2016 All Bugs Good and Bad webinar series. We certainly have a great schedule lined up, and today's presenter will surely not disappoint if any of you have ever heard of Dr. A. Before we get going today and in introducing our speaker, I'd like to cover a few of our housekeeping topics. First, you'll notice that there's a chat box on the left side of the screen. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please type them there. Also, throughout the webinar, we'll be answering a few questions, and we'll be posting links to various sources of information throughout the program. At the end of the webinar, there will be a few questions and a link for a follow-up survey. Please, please take a moment to fill out these so that we can continue to improve this series. Lastly, I'd like to say thanks to Dr. Kathy Flanders of Alabama Extension for working so diligently for putting this series together. I'd like to thank Clemson Cooperative Extension for putting some stuff together for us and helping bring these webinars to you, as well as the E-Extension Communities, Imported Fire Ants, the Urban IPM, the Alabama Cooperative Extension System, the University of Georgia Center for Urban Agriculture, and the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. So without further ado, our presenter today is Dr. Ayanava Mujumdar, or for people like me, he likes to go by Dr. A. He's an extension entomologist responsible for integrated pest management or IPM programs in vegetable and peanut production throughout the state of Alabama. He's also our state coordinator for the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program at Auburn University. Currently, Dr. A's organic IPM research focuses on the use of trap crops, bioinsecticides, and pest exclusion systems. Besides developing extension publications for farmers, he also shares IPM for information via social media like Facebook and a weekly newsletter. So without further ado, Dr. A, it's all yours. All right. Uh, thank you, and welcome, everybody. It's kind of unusual that I'm not able to look at the 130 people in this room, but uh, we're all virtually here, and... Uh, it's kind of fun to do these webinars, and uh, thank you, Kathy, and uh, and the extension staff for helping, and and thank you, moderators. Uh, you guys, let me know if my voice falls off. Um, but um, here you go. Um, you already heard a little bit about me on this slide here. Uh, I have my website, which has a lot more information, and you can always join on Facebook. So if I get cut off at the end, do not worry. There's a lot of good information on the web pages, and uh, please use them. I'm going to start a little bit slowly and just tell you what we're going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to give you a few, a little description of what some of the uh, insect pests I frequently work with or see in, the, in our research plots out here in Alabama. Uh, Alabama is, is hot and humid, um, and uh, we, our insects never sleep almost. And, uh, and then I'll talk about some sustainable uh, pest management basics, um, uh, especially from the vegetable side. I am a gardener myself, and uh, and I help producers at the same time. So um, you know, some of what you will hear, you have to use very creatively uh, in your system uh, and see which one works best. But we're going to talk about the three levels of pest management um, uh, that's recommended by USDA, and also a lot of the organic certifiers uh, use this system, uh, which is the trap crops, pest exclusion, and biorational insecticides as the last resort. And then I'll mention about some education resources at the end. Uh, here's a disclaimer. Uh, remember that a lot of the information you're going to see, I'm not presenting the hard research data. I try to put in more pictures and less words um, and data on the slides. But you know, research is done in controlled environments. So um, remember to use your imagination to use some of what you are learning today uh, in your in your garden or farm. Uh, name of those products and companies do not mean that I am endorsing them. I'm not a salesman. Uh, so you, I'll talk about uh, a lot of different products uh, and, and strategies. And, and, and again, the goal is site-specific IPM, and that's really critical, that each farm is different, and uh, you have different diversity of plants and different diversity of insects out there. So... Uh, Keep record and uh, and adapt what you learned today uh, to your farm or garden, and contact your extension for the most updated um, information. 
Uh, so now you can have, you know, you can make some popcorn and sit back and enjoy the show. I'm just kidding. All right, let's talk about some of the insect pests that are polyphagous, which means that they they feed on a variety of host plants and they move constantly. A lot of these insects are very good at uh, flying, moving, and finding their host plants. And uh, one of the things that I was really um, bugged with this year was aphids. Uh, we had tremendous aphid issues, um, and um, and again, it was very difficult to do some of the work on aphids. Um, but there are some several species of aphids active. Uh, the picture on the bottom right of your screen, you know, that is too late to control aphids. So um, you, aphid is best controlled if you are trying to prevent it rather than at the end when the population really rises. So that's what I want to give that, that message out to everybody, that aphids are difficult uh, with some of the organic needs that we have today. Uh, we have a large number of species of caterpillars. And I know when it's hot and you're out scouting for these insects, they all look the same, don't they? But uh, they are different, and species identification is very important because the control recommendation, especially if you're using bioinsecticides or even, even conventional insecticides. I do research on conventional insecticides. These worms, these caterpillars, uh, behave differently. They have different uh, uh, susceptibility to products. So that's very important. The pest identification is, is very important. Uh, make sure you're using your extension system and using the extension agents um, to get these insects identified. I do a lot of work on this group of insects, which is the leaf-footed bugs and sting bugs, uh, because uh, they have a very unique behavior, uh, especially with leaf-footed bugs. They form these large aggregations on uh, on crops, uh, like the picture shows here, you, leaf fruit bugs, you don't see them one at a time. Oftentimes, they're two or four, um, and oftentimes, they're out there mating. So uh, they form these large aggregations, and they can very severely damage the crop with their feeding. And the picture on the uh, bottom there, on the bottom right, shows you the uh, fruit damage on tomatoes. Um, the photo that shows the eggplants being fed with leaf fruit bugs, those insects can cause that eggplant, the fruit and the flower, to fall off the plants, uh, causing pretty significant uh, problem, especially in small gardens or organic farms, because uh, none of the birational insecticides really are, are working well enough to keep them at bay. So we're going to talk about that a little bit further. And of course, this insect, tomato hornworms, uh, I don't know why, but a lot of people don't see them or don't complain of them, but um, out in some of my research plots, if I don't control this insect, uh, the hornworms can totally ruin an experiment. The pressure can be so high that there's nothing left for the army worms to feed on because these insects come ahead of uh, most other caterpillars and establish really quickly in central Alabama. Um, and uh, they are a constant pest. Uh, I think a lot of the home gardeners have major issues with this. And um, they're not very difficult to control, so we'll talk about them a little bit more. But uh, they are a major pest here in Alabama. And these tiny insects, after looking at those big caterpillars, these insects are smaller. These are the trichome cucumber beetles. And there are a number of species. Uh, their names often reflect their colors and patterns that they have. And um, they can do pretty severe damage, especially in Alabama. We see them in uh, right after transplanting. Within a week or so, you start seeing this migration in early spring, migration of these uh, the adults. And uh, they come from weeds uh, that grow around the field. So weed control, uh, you know, it, it becomes very important. Uh, uh, one, one of the important things in gardens and organic farms uh, but these insects can feed on the transplants. They can feed on the leaves as the plants grow, uh, especially the cucurbits, and even the fruits. So um, they can cause uh, pretty severe damage uh, at several stages of the plant. And they transmit uh, bacterial well, so that's another danger. 
Okay, I'm going to move to some insects that have somewhat restricted host range. For example, squash bugs. And I know a lot of you guys love squash bugs. Uh, no, again, I'm kidding. Just to keep you all awake. Uh, squash bugs, nobody likes them because they, again, form these large aggregations uh, under the leaves. They are very good at hiding under the leaves, under rocks. Uh, you put a piece of cardboard out there, they will go hide under it. Uh, so they're very cryptic insects. And uh, unfortunately, we have seen an explosion of these squash bugs um, in Alabama and, uh, and across the southern region. It's a major, major pest. And again, very difficult to control if you are trying to directly use an organic insecticide or a home garden insecticide, uh, especially if there are only approved or organic type. Um, some of the chemical products work a little bit better. Uh, but um, these insects are also bad because they transmit uh, yellow vine decline or yellow vine disease. And uh, that happens late in the stage uh, of the plant. You see a sudden uh, uh, collapse of the plants. Uh, due to excessive feeding and, and uh, the disease. So be aware of that. Uh, it sometimes gets confusing. So you remember your phones have a text uh, feature and you have a camera on. So use the camera and the text features to contact your extension and send photographs uh, and, and share samples, definitely. Uh, another uh, insect which we frequently see early in the spring is a squash vine borer. Uh, this insect um, is out there early in the spring. The females will start laying eggs, eggs at the base of the uh, plants. And oftentimes, gardeners and producers think that it's a, a very pretty little butterfly or a little, pretty little wasp. Well, it really isn't. It's the squash vine borer. And um, it uh, will lay those eggs. And the caterpillar, once it gets inside that vine, it is very difficult to kill it with uh, materials we have today. Uh, there are some mechanical ways you can uh, cut, you know, cut open a little bit of the stem and take that, uh, take that caterpillar out, but it's a very labor-intensive process. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, some of the mechanical ways, like dust exclusion, that uh, works a little bit better. Now, I, I wanted to kind of uh, also mention that some of those caterpillars uh, and even uh, squash vine borers. Um, I encourage new producers, if you are out there listening today, um, that remember there are pest monitoring tools, for example, pheromone traps, that can be used very effectively to know when these pests are active, when they are building up. And if you do it for a couple of years, you will have enough confidence and keep good records to learn from uh, and design your own site-specific IPM strategy. So. Remember that we have pheromone traps. They're relatively inexpensive now. After spending thousands of dollars on transplants and fertilizers and everything else, uh, it, it uh, makes sense to have a monitoring system out there to watch for these insects and uh, using those traps. So we have used the modern technology. In Alabama, we do have a statewide monitoring system that we send out uh, alerts uh, to our producers to what's happening. Um, and you can look, at, look us up. It's uh, Alabama IPM Communicator Newsletter. That's where we publish these, uh, that information. Now, let's here, um, move to a different topic slightly and talk about management, which I know a lot of you are out here listening today. But you, know, you can forget my name after this conversation. But remember this, the three letters there, IPM. Do not forget that, because otherwise I'm going to call you. Uh, now, I'm not going to call you, but uh, IPM, or Integrated Pest Management, uh, it's basically a threshold-based management system. It incorporates your experience, uh, because my experience in Alabama could be very different from yours. So it uses some of that experience and a scientific basis to, to the decision that an insect needs to be controlled. So don't freak out when you see one aphid. Uh, you have time. And uh, you don't have to go out spraying. But IPM essentially helps to understand and use these different um, um, uh, approaches to pest management, uh, different strategies. And uh, that's really the goal of IPM. Unfortunately, the problem is we tend to look for insects very late. We forget about them. And that leads to overuse of insecticide. 
and uh, there's a lot of controversy about that. And uh, I think even in the organic systems, we have to spray a lot because we are not able to prevent some of these insects uh, from getting from building up in our in our garden and farms. And then, uh, of course, with overuse of insecticides, we are wiping out uh, beneficial insects. Even some of the organic products can be very um, deadly to some of these beneficial insects when they're small uh, in their immature stages. So remember to read the label very carefully when you're using any product out there. This is what I teach to my uh, master gardeners and organic farmers, small farmers, beginning farmers, is remember the three approaches or three strategies to pest management, sustainable pest management. First is the systems-based practices, and basically it means um, everything of how to grow a healthy plant. A healthy plant will have less problems. A stressed plant will have more problems, so it's very common sense. So that's called systems-based practices, and one of the things we're going to talk about uh, is trap crops, which I do uh, quite a bit of uh, research and demonstrations on. And then um, level two is the mechanical and physical practices, and uh, we are going to talk about pest exclusion strategies and uh, talk a little bit about some of the research. Again, this is very preliminary um, webinar. I hope to continue this in future webinars where we can go into more details of individual topics. Uh, I can do almost two hours on every topic out here. And then if those two levels fail, or if you have used those two levels, then you have birational insecticides, uh, which have less non-target effects if they're used correctly, and use them as the last resort. But remember, birational insecticides, if you are living in a very high pest pressure situation, um, they are a tool for us, not to forget them. All right, um, let's talk about trap crops. And really, what uh, the principle behind it, uh, I don't have a slide. I, I think I, I forgot to put the slide in. But the basic principle is of host preference, uh, which means that insects, like humans, like us, they have a variety of taste. Uh, they have preference for food. And uh, we use that to control them. So we give them a food. They, they, an alternate food that they like so that they stay away from our main crop. So in a trap crop system, there's two important things. It's the, the, the main crop that you're trying to protect, that's the crop you're trying to eat or sell, and then you have the, um, the trap crop, which is uh, a distraction for the insect. And there are different ways of doing this. If you don't know where your insects are and how they are migrating, um, then there are some different layouts. Uh, a perimeter trap cropping system, and you may have seen this in magazines and uh, websites. Um, uh, a lot has been written about them. Uh, the perimeter system is really wonderful because it, it covers the main crop on all sides. The problem is it's very labor intensive, and if you have equipment, if you're a producer out there trying to do a perimeter trap crop becomes a very painful process, um, especially trying to uh, move around and, and navigate. Uh, so, um, but it's an option for small gardeners, small farms. Um, that's a great way to, to think about it. But a lot of the farmers in Alabama and elsewhere um, have moved on to this strip interplant or kind of perimeter trap cropping, but with just two sides, on the two sides. And again, the idea is to allow you know, this minimum land in trap crop. Most of your land is in main crops, so you're not cutting away your main crop production. Um, so there's different ways. And again, um, as you get experience, I've seen farmers become more and more uh, creative about how they use uh, trap crops. And the area starts to reduce and uh, without giving up the pest management benefit. So uh, you have to be, it takes experience to learn this system to say the least. And I'll show you some pictures of how we have done research, and now this is in demonstration phase. Uh, here's a system. This is really uh, in central Alabama where we had about one and a half, two acres of tomatoes, bell peppers. Uh, you don't see the plants. They are kind of hidden by this wall. It's kind of a wall of sorghum and sunflower. 
and we're using a very special variety of sorghum NK300, uh, and you can see that on the slide, that NK300, I have not seen another variety um, so far in my evaluation that is extremely attractive to leaf-footed bugs. And those leaf-footed bugs, once they are migrating, uh, they'll first land on the sunflower. Sunflower is a short-season crop. So we put it on the outside, uh, and at least two rows of sunflower. And then we have sorghum that uh, planted two weeks ahead of the main crop that we're trying to protect. And when these plants come up, the first um, activities on sunflower, the uh, sunflower blooms, and it starts to attract those leaf-footed bugs and sting bugs. And um, then they need continuous food. Sunflower don't last very long. So that sorghum, as the head emerges, that head is what the insect is after. That head has the milk in it. And sting bugs, leaf-footed bugs absolutely love it to death. And it is so powerful that they will actually leave the tomato and start moving to that wall of sorghum and trap crop. And we have done a lot of demonstrations uh, on this uh, process. Uh, here's another layout. Oh, here's another view of the same plot. And now you can see the short distance we have between the main crop and the sorghum trap crop. Uh, this time you don't see the sunflower there. Uh, it's hidden behind that sorghum. But this is very effective in, at short, uh, even at short distances. And I've seen this again also in lab uh, studies where we have done uh, uh, host plant uh, studies within in the lab with different crops. One thing I will mention, because you guys are attending this webinar, this is a secret. Uh, it's a secret with 166 people now, that uh, okra is a major problem. And plant your okra very carefully. Uh, I know people love okra, especially in the south. But okra can attract a lot of these insects, and it can disbalance the sorghum sunflower trap crop system if you plant it too close. Um, one of the reasons is uh, some of these okra varieties are extremely tall. Uh, that height uh, is one of the reasons that this system is very successful with uh, an insect like uh, leaf footed bugs that uh, tends to come in large numbers. But these leaf footed bugs will stay on that trap crop, and that's where we control them. Um, Uh, here's the producer. Uh, here's the producer who actually used the system and who designed it in a way that he had the crops uh, that sorghum uh, in between his uh, crops. So that's one thing I recommend to producers is if you're wondering how to best use it and keep it simple, is to plant these trap crops uh, between uh, different crops. Uh, and that way you will reduce the migration that happens of different insects. Uh, but this is kind of a, a strip uh, trap cropping system that you see on, on, on the slide here. Now, I mentioned about control. We tried to use some organic insecticides, uh, but we mistargeted. We, uh, you use the insecticides only on the sorghum um, because you don't want to spray the sunflowers. And, uh, and we, we actually spray so light that the sunflower is gone, so we don't kill beneficial insects and pollinators. So if you're wondering, we tried spraying the trap crop with organic insects at the sorghum trap crop. The problem was adults are very difficult to kill with what we have today. I recommend using um, uh, some tank mix of organic insect sites like Bionic and Trust. Um, I'm not really sure uh, the, the rate of application, but target the nymphs, uh, and you'll see the nymphs, the, the, the immature stages. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's a very painful to try to go after the adults. Uh, so again, don't use it too much. You don't need too much, because those leaf-fed bugs and sting bugs will stain the trap crop. So it gives you time to get your production done. Another benefit uh, of using trap crop system uh, is increase in beneficial insect activity. And there are research papers published um, about this. And we had an entomology student um, who also worked on this and uh, found out that the trap crop system, especially if you have two rows of each of these uh, trap crops and you have enough 
uh, you know, it provides shelter to leaflet bugs and also uh, it's, it's uh, parasites and predators. So you will see an increase in spider activity. There are spiders, and I forget the name, um, but I see uh, uh, one particular species, especially feeding on my on the sorghum, and they will catch those adult uh, leaf footed bugs and feed on them. Uh, so it's pretty remarkable to see that. But also we see a pretty high rate of uh, parasitization uh, with tachini flies, and uh, those flies will lay eggs on those leaf footed bugs. So uh, I don't know exactly what kind of impact is happening, but this is happening with the trap crop system. Um, so it attracts the beneficial insects as well and protects them. And we have tried trap cropping in community garden. And uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Chris Becker, who is now the county extension coordinator in North Alabama, he started this um, uh, community garden in Florence, Alabama. And uh, we actually tried um, trap cropping of sorghum and sunflower in raised beds, which was very interesting to see, the, to say the least. And I've heard uh, gardeners actually use uh, the trap crop um, in pots and move the pots around. So there's any number of ways you can do this. Um, and you have to be creative again, as I said. Now, we have used the same principle of trap cropping and now gone to different crops. Uh, for example, we are testing Hubbard trap crop. Hubbard squash is a winter uh, squash has large fruits that are actually edible, but that Hubbard squash is very attractive to cucumber beetles, squash bugs, and squash vine borers. And we are evaluating this on in the field. Um, we had some problems with plant stands, so we are trying to refine our research methods at this point. But uh, our preliminary data shows that in the presence of Hubbard, trap crop, which is planted two weeks ahead of the main crop, it gets the first flush or the first populations of those migratory cucumber beetles and also attracts the squash bugs. And the relief that you get in the main crop is pretty significant. And uh, in fact, last year we produced our first almost or yeah, completely insecticide-free yellow squash because we had this small flop. Uh, this hover trap crop protecting yellow squash. Uh, but now again, I can give you a, uh, an entire lecture on just uh, the trap crop system. So I won't go into too much detail. I will tell you that we have some YouTube videos online. Uh, you should watch them if you are interested and give it a try on your farm. We don't. I don't have all the answers yet, but uh, we um, we can certainly help you and again contact your extension. But it's pretty remarkable to see that the cucumber beetles and squash bugs will prefer to feed on the Hubbard and leave the yellow squash that you're trying to sell or eat alone. And, uh, and there's a cost recovery in this case where you can actually sell that Hubbard fruit. Uh, it's pretty remarkable how fast growing Hubbard is, and you can recover the cost of trap cropping. So that's another uh, selling point of uh, using a trap crop system. The problem you run into so is land. Uh, some of these systems may take up uh, a lot of your land. If you're a small gardener, it's really difficult to do, and I realize that. So again, use a variety of techniques. Um, and here's an, another example of trap cropping. In this case, we are trying to protect cabbage from insects like a yellow margin leaf beetle. Uh, this beetle, um, it's very common in Alabama, but a lot of the producers are not able to identify it. It loves turnips and napa cabbage, the Chinese cabbage, and it will totally devastate the crop. And you can see that on this slide well, with, the, uh, with the strips that's marked with the arrow, you can see the untreated check. It's, uh, and you see the, the border effect where you have a heavy feeding of yellow margin leaf beetle that has totally shred those turnips in the middle. And then you can see some of the treatments we are uh, still experimenting with. Um, and you can see the variety of response we are getting. So uh, spinosad, again, uh, spinosad and pyganic, these are the uh, old organic products. Um, and they seem to, to help out somewhat with this um, insect. But again, we're using this trap crop to keep the yellow margin leaf beetle out of the cabbage and reduce the damage on cabbage. Um, 
again, for more information, please go online and look at the training modules I have. I have uh, the leaf fluid buff training module, squash, and also um, the yellow margin leaf beetle. We have done two webinars, e-organic webinars, uh, in the past two years that are archived on my website, uh, which is www.aces.edu slash vegetable IPM, or just Google Alabama vegetable IPM. Let's talk about pest exclusion, which is level two tactic. And again, this is good for uh, especially the high tunnel producers, if you're out there listening, and, and small gardeners. Uh, the principle behind it is very simple, that we are trying to uh, block the insects from getting to the host plant. So it sounds very simple, but I have learned from experience of doing this over the years. I have made some very expensive mistakes, and uh, there can be problems. So again, um, all these solutions, they need some extra management effort on your part when you use them. None of these solutions are the silver bullet solution, as we call them, they will not solve all your pest problems, so you have to be creative in, in, uh, in using these. Uh, and, and with pest exclusion, one of the things you can do is you can use it for early season pest management. And uh, I know of farmers in Alabama that are doing that. For example, if you're trying to grow eggplants, uh, tomatoes early in the season, and you're devastated with early season pests like tree beetles and aphids, pest exclusion can really help in that case. Um, but again, um, and, and you can also do permanent pest exclusion, which means season-long pest exclusion, for example, in high tunnel. And we'll talk about it a little bit today. Um, but again, when you think about pest exclusion, be very careful about the material and how you design it. Uh, this was the first net house we built in Alabama, and we did some studies in there, but basically it's a sealed structure uh, with all the sides closed. We used a very heavy density material to keep even the small insects out. The problem, as you may already be thinking, is uh, the problem here in Alabama with the heat was we, kept, we had too much heat in there. So although it was great from the in, from insect perspective, we had problems um, with disease. and and I will admit, we did not grow all crops, uh, especially we did not grow any open pollinated or insect pollinated crops. We grew crops that did not read uh, uh, pollination, insect pollination, uh, or bees, for example, um, in those in the structure just for our, our study and to learn from this. Um, but this is a very expensive structure um, that was sponsored by the, by the company. Pest exclusion does work, and uh, I learned it uh, almost five years back now, uh, six years back, and uh, it definitely kept the hornworms out, and it kept majority of the army worms out. The problems with army worms is army worms are very good at adapting to what you do. For example, uh, in this netting, in this net house, when we had some storms in Alabama, uh, it created minor holes. Uh, kind of stretch the fabric, and those army worms were able to, the females would lay eggs. They can't enter the structure, but they will lay eggs on those openings, and the caterpillar would crawl into that net house and infest the crop. So there we have it. The insects are very adaptive creatures. So um, um, this is, again, was a very expensive study. We, we discontinued this study very quickly because we had disease issues on top. But what it showed us was the promise that it can reduce um, insect pressures to some manage manageable levels. Uh, and that's an important thing when you're trying to be organic. So we decided to work on some low cost ways. And one of the things I have done and used quite successfully in my garden and still continue to do it in our research plots, and I've seen producers do it, is use these light fabrics. Uh, very light fabric. Uh, it's called Super Light Insect Barrier. That's sold by GardensAlive.com. Uh, in fact, there's another vendor that I found, an, an, a new product. Uh, I wrote, out, wrote down a little note about it. Um, 
The other one is called Agro Fabric Pro 19, and it's sold by Seven Springs Farm. Now, these fabric, they are very light, very lightweight, easy to put on, very cheap. Uh, you can get small or big rolls of it. But the problem is they don't last very long. So I end up buying every year. But what the way I use it and highly recommend it is using these immediately after transplanting and um, before the plants are too big. And that way it prevents uh, aphids and flea beetles uh, if you already don't have them in the ground hiding. But put them on immediately after transplanting. And that is a very good prevention uh, strategy for uh, gardens, small farms, and they are, these are available in big rolls. Um, and I looked up this morning uh, preparing for this webinar. Um, they are cost effective. If you are producing some high value crops, uh, you can co recover the cost with the crop that you grow inside. And there's different ways to put it on. So you can develop your own system. Uh, the photograph I showed you, those were done on raised beds uh, in a community garden down at uh, in Mobile, Alabama, uh, where they have a tremendous pop, uh, problem with flea beetles. And uh, these are some of the photographs to show you the difference it makes uh, between you know, having the, sh the shade on there, the, having the, that netting. So it did a big difference. Uh, I don't think I have a picture of um, netting and the eggplants, but we did some studies with eggplants, and uh, we found out that the eggplants, with the heat that was trapped under those fa that fabric, eggplants grew faster. So it promoted um, promoted uh, the growth of the plants as well, as well as keeping the insects away. So now we are doing some work with producers because this fabric that I talked about doesn't last very long. We are, we are looking for some durable materials that last longer. And one of the things we have found out is almost everybody that's out there producing crops or has a high tunnel, they have shade cloth. So shade, shade cloth by itself, the nature of that product, it has remarkable pest exclusion properties. So uh, again, but this is by no way to tell you to say that, yes, you can solve all your pest problems by using shade cloth and that everybody should have a shade cloth. But uh, for high tunnel producers, we are experimenting with different models in the lab, and we we get products from the companies, and um, I'll show you some of the products. But we make these small models and uh, and put the the glass on, and then we release insects inside and study insect behavior, and we can actually put host plants like little fruits inside those models and uh, test uh, what happens when we put fruit. Uh, a food in there, and again, the goal is to find out which insects can stay out. We can keep them out and reduce the pressures. So we have these 40, uh, the common ones, 30%, 40%, and 50% shade cloth, and you also see uh, one of the models that has the super light insect barrier uh, use of it uh, if you're not using any shade cloth. And we have found out that uh, we compared some of the products. Um, Again, there, there's so much to talk about here that I'm going to run out of time. But I will tell you that uh, politics out of Minnesota and some others that sell uh, this type of shade cloth, a uh, 40%, that has been pretty good at stopping most of the moths, um, most of the moths so that you don't get caterpillars, uh, sting bug and leaf fruit bug adults. Uh, it works really well, and it's cost effective. Um, the other benefit we also noticed from our research in the lab, and now we are working with farmers, we also found out that lady beetles and some of the beneficial insects uh, will actually land on that 40% and crawl inside. So it's not excluding all your natural enemies. Um, you can have that problem if you use a very fine knitting, like 40%, and some of the uh, other 40% uh, or 50%, I'm sorry, 50%, that material could be too dense. And keep all the uh, keep national enemies out, and you don't want that. So again, I think uh, there's a learning curve to this, and you can uh, contact me, uh, uh, and and uh, I can give you more information on this. Uh, here are some producers that are actually doing it, and this is all, uh, all of these sites are 
sort of our on-farm locations for studies, uh, but uh, farmers can install this uh, the shade cloth as a pest exclusion strategy uh, on the underside. So when you roll up the sides, it keeps the insects out. And um, it's really effective. I think the next slide, this slide explains to you what happens. You get a big relief, uh, for example, with a 40 and a 50% shade cloth, you can get a pretty significant relief from caterpillars, uh, for example, army worms, and also leaf fruit bugs and sting bugs. So it's pretty remarkable, and you have to tweak the system uh, to your benefit to, to, and, and kind of optimize it to your location. Uh, but this is just uh, very early information for everybody, and you can explore more on my website. And this is from our lab studies uh, with the 40 and a 50% shade cloth. The leaf fruit bugs can't get in, and they cannot feed on that okra that they absolutely love. And if you notice, if you take walk back a few feet and look at the photograph, you will be able to see what the leaf fruit bugs have done to that 30%, because they are able to go through the 30%. Uh, so they will feed on that okra and cause those little bumps on okra. And uh, they can do pretty significant damage. So, but 40 and 50 percent, you get uh, a big time relief from leaf-footed bugs from these large insects. Well, there are problems, as I said. Everything has a problem. It can backfire. For example, uh, as I said, army worms are sneaky. They will adapt to what you do. Um, fire ants can be uh, a problem uh, with all this. They love to go into those those uh, little shady places and make a nest. Uh, and there are some products out there now that can be used, as uh, some baked products, and then disease. So watch out for high temperature and heat trap. Uh, if you are in that situation, take off the covers. Um, do not use this tactic. And I have some extension resources that you can uh, read on your own. Um, and I have just released uh, one uh, uh, a little bulletin on SARE, the Southern SARE website, on the High Tunnel Pest Exclusion System, or HTPE. So take a look at it, uh, and please contact me if you have questions. Last but not the least, uh, don't forget that we do have bioreactional insecticides. And uh, again, you should check the Organic Materials Review Institute, or OMRI, for a complete list of products. And this is very good for Open field, uh, you can use it for open field crops um, and also in gardens. And now we have a lot of products for home gardeners uh, interested in vegetable production. Uh, this is just a general list of organic products. And I tried to update this, but I may have failed. But uh, anyway, it gives you an idea of what's out there. You have basically four types of organic products. Um, there's physical poisons. You have contact poisons uh, or, or products with contact action, which is a large number of products that's out there, which includes your oils, uh, neem, organic, or pyrethrin, soap, insectile soap, uh, spinelfit, and the microbial, uh, uh, all the microbial products that are fungus and virus-based uh, products. They have um, uh, a contact action. Um, there's also products that are very popular, like BT, which has stomach action. And viruses also have stomach action, which means that BT has to be eaten by the insect in order to be effective. Um, so insects have to have a lethal dose. Um, so you have to spray and wait for the insect to chomp on the food, and then they get sick. One thing I will remind you, uh, everybody, is these products take time. They don't persist very long. So spray in a way that protects them and, and, uh, and give them time. So be patient. Uh, do not expect dramatic results like chemicals. Um, and then we have some volatile products that I do not work on so much. Uh, but they are out there. And be careful. Read the label before you use them on crops. Because some of these products can burn sensitive crops. I'm going to give you just a very quick overview of, of some of the major findings. 
Uh, in Alabama, with our caterpillar population, we have a very heavy caterpillar population, as I said before, uh, in the in summer season and in, in the cool season crops. Uh, here's a picture of cabbage plots, research plots, where uh, you can see on, on one side of the, uh, on the slide shows you the damage from caterpillar feeding um, and contamination. Uh, you can have 40 to 50 percent damage or contaminated produce if you do not do anything. So that's something I tell our producers that insects, once they, once they come, they're not going to leave. They're going to eat and breed in that crop and destroy the crop. So we have to do something. And organic insecticides, one of the tools that we can use as a last resort. And we found out that Bt, um, instead of using Dipel, which is a very popular Bt, we actually use Zentari, which is a different subspecies of Bt. But Zentari is a great product. Uh, it, it's especially effective against armyworms. Um, because we do have army worms to deal with in the hot summers. Uh, so a lot of farmers who do not like insect identification are confused about them. Uh, there are products that are out there, including Bt, that can give you uh, very good results. The problem is you have to repeat spraying continuously, almost every week or every five days, and use a lot of material. So that's the drawback of this product. But if you are an organic farmer on a large scale, uh, it's very worthwhile to look at uh, these organic insecticides to use them. Um, we have also studied some uh, tank mixes, for example, using Zentari, which is a BT with Biganic. And again, you get very good results if you're consistently spraying the crop. This is tomatoes because everybody loves tomatoes. So we had to do some work on tomatoes. And you see a very uniform product if you use these organic insecticides in the correct way. They can help you get a more uniform, high-quality product. So uh, it can be done. You have to be patient with these products and try them uh, in, in the correct way. So again, just kind of summarizing that, remember, most organic insecticides uh, have very short residual. Um, remember, prevention is important. So use those other methods that uh, were shown to you very creatively, and then use insecticides when insects are in low numbers. Don't wait for the insects to increase. Uh, and that's one of the drawbacks with organic systems. You have to spray a little bit ahead or as soon as the insects are there, some of those major ones, if you're, if you're in a zone that you, you know you're going to have problems. Uh, so prevention is important. Uh, you may have to apply two to four or more sprays, so be patient. And use good equipment. That's so important. I see gardeners and, and uh, producers uh, using old equipment with worn-out nozzles that drips too much and wastes the material. So you need to invest in a good sprayer and, uh, uh, and use a good sprayer to reach out to those uh, uh, hard-to-reach plant canopy spray. And I'll finish off by saying, kind of reminding about some of the uh, resources we have for producers, which includes this IPM slide chart. Uh, it's a handy starting tool. It's an IPM toolkit. Um, if you want a copy, please email me um, or any of the moderators um, or Dr. Flanders, and I, I can send you uh, copies to, uh, to use. Uh, but this is a very important tool for our producers here in Alabama, uh, the vegetable slide chart. I also have a newsletter uh, that goes out to producers. And if you want to subscribe, you can email me or visit the website that's on top and subscribe yourself. Uh, it will send you a confirmation email. If you click it, it will, it will automatically add you to our newsletter database. So use it. It's a blog, so you can read it on mobile devices. We also have a nice website with learning modules or training modules that you can watch the videos and read the publications about a technology on the same page. And of course, we can't forget the social media. Social media is very important for us to reach out. So please uh, join me uh, on Facebook. I don't have all the answers to the questions you may 
post, but I will try my best with the experience we have and uh, uh, join there. It's a great way to see and share information. Uh, we also link this to our uh, website and our newsletter. So it's a good source of information. With that, I'm going to stop and open the floor to the for questions. Thank you, everyone. Hey, Dr. Ayanava, we thank you for being with us, and we thank you for um, all that good information. I always learn something every time that I talk to you, and I definitely did today. Uh, one of the questions uh, a little further back was, where can we find that variety of sorghum you were talking about for trap cropping uh, leaf-footed bugs? Very good question. Um, well, again, um, you can look up that information on the website. I think I have it on my training module that I have created for leaf-footed bugs uh, and trap crops. Uh, but I will tell you, uh, the, the, when we first started, uh, we bought seed from a company in Texas, uh, Sorghum Partners. Sorghum Partners. Uh, but recently we have had problems getting the seed from there. I think uh, we are buying this year from Wilbur Ellis um, some of our trap crop seed. And uh, I think they have untreated and treated seed. Um, and we, I think we just bought some untreated seed for, uh, for our research. And uh, we give out samples to our Alabama farmers during our meetings uh, free to try trap cropping on their farm. Um, but Wilbur Ellis and Sorghum Partners are the two that come to my mind right away. Okay, um, another question. Actually, uh, first, we're going to pop up a couple of questions on the screen uh, for the participants. If you guys wouldn't mind answering those, those help us a lot. And uh, we're going to put a link to a survey. If you, if you don't mind taking that survey, it helps us to uh, do a better job at these um, webinars. We want to we talk about what you guys need to know. So if you will help fill out that survey, that would be fantastic. Uh, one question is, what is the best way to plant trap crops in a raised bed community garden setting type? That's one that um, I've come across myself. OK. Um, again, I don't have a lot of experience uh, doing trap crop studies in community garden situations, but I have some ideas. I think what we did at the Florence Community Garden, uh, that picture I showed everybody, was uh, we basically hand uh, planted from seed um, in those raised beds. So we created a very shallow furrow and uh, you know, uh, watered it down, put some fertilizer in there under, uh, not to touch the seed, and then put the seed in there and uh, provided some water. Sorghum and sunflowers, they come up really quick uh, if it is warm enough and with enough moisture. And uh, both of these trap crops are, to me, minimum maintenance. Uh, crops, uh, they grow really fast. And uh, uh, the other thing I wanted to tell you is in community gardens, if, say, if you have a garden with 40 raised beds, a large number of raised beds, put them on different ends of, uh, if you have spare beds, use them on uh, those spare beds uh, farther away or farthest away to see where these insects are coming from. So you have some idea. Um, of the migration pattern and when they're coming. And again, it boils down to keeping good records. Uh, you do it a few years, and you learn from that experience. OK, um, how about what uh, we talked about what works best for a trap crop for squash. That would be the Hubbard squash, correct? Correct. Did I answer the question completely, Allison?
I'm sorry, I said a whole bunch of stuff, and my mic was turned off. <laughs> okay. All right, I'll, I'll just go ahead and do it again. No problem. Yeah, if you've if you got any questions, type them into the chat box, and we'll try to get them answered. And we do thank you for your participation. Um, if you have any more questions, send them to Dr. Ayanava, or you can um, talk to, you can also talk to uh, your extension agent. Um, you know, we're a great resource for you guys. Uh, if we can take down those questions, and then maybe put up the link to the survey. Um, there's the link to the survey, if you guys don't mind um, taking that survey. Uh, next time, we have um, Kill the Queen the first time, tips for making fire ant mound treatments, and that's July, March 4th at 1 o'clock. We thank you for your participation. Thank you. I know if you see anything in that chat box that you'd like to answer, just go right ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, um, I don't work on spotted wing drosophila, uh, but we have some ideas floating around. Uh, Ayanaba, we lost your audio. Did you accidentally mute the phone, possibly? Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't see any other questions. So uh, I think we're going to wrap it up. We we thank you for your participation, and uh, look forward to having you on March fourth.